Hi, I'm Brad Hubert, and I hope you've had an amazing week. As this virus and this pandemic rolls on and the implications of this continue to reverberate through our society, just know that I'm praying for you. You're loved. You're not alone. We're in our third, no, fourth, fourth week of our series called The Dream We All Share. This dream of whatever heaven is, we want more of that here and now on earth. It turns out that no matter who we are and where we are and when we lived and what we value, we all tend to have the same dream of heaven on earth because we share the same maker. It turns out it's his dream stamped on what it means to be human. And you can see this dream expressed all the way back in the pages of Genesis, the very beginning of the Bible, as God hovers over the darkness and the, the chaos and creates this beautiful world, which is mostly like an outback with a garden called Eden that he plants in the east that is a biological expression of heaven on earth. What does he do next? I'm telling the story every time so that we remember it. He creates Adam and Eve to be his viceroys here on earth, right? His proxies here on earth to tend the garden and then what? be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it so that we can expand this Eden and so that it becomes everywhere, right? So the Eden project is meant to take over the world. This expression of God's kingdom here on earth is meant to envelop the whole earth. Of course, this entire project is sidelined by three profound rebellions in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, where God has to act so decisively that it affects everyone everywhere from then on. We talked about the fact that as a result of these rebellions, sin and the power of death reverberate throughout all creation and infect and corrupt everything. We begin these demonic partnerships with supernatural beings as we're clawing for more power over the earth because we gave our authority to the devil away. So we lose our ability to subdue the earth. So we're looking for ways to compensate for that lack of authority. And then of course we scatter and we're you know, in the midst of human history unfolding. And we don't see Jesus until thousands of years later in this story when God intervenes again decisively through his death and resurrection. Last week, we talked about the fact that Jesus, although he came to forgive my sins, although he died on the cross to restore me into right relationship with God, the picture of what he's here to accomplish is far greater. You could actually say that Jesus came to reverse the effects of all three of those Genesis rebellions and to reboot his heaven on earth agenda here and now. My relationship to God is part of that picture, but it is no, by no means the greatest part of that picture. So last week we talked about how Jesus reversed the first two of those rebellions, the one that occurred in Eden and the one surrounding the flood, which was probably the one we're least familiar with, as the sons of God, these quasi-divine little d beings, marry and interbreed with human women to pr produce these these hybrid offspring that are unholy, the Nephilim, and God has to wipe out the world because it results in a proliferation of evil, acceleration of human depravity, all of that. So we've been talking about the implications of that and what Jesus reversed. Okay, so I had to break the three rebellions up because I did not have time to cover them all in one message. In fact, that probably felt like a lot. So today what I want to do is I want to go back to the Tower of Babel, which is the third rebellion found in Genesis chapter 11. And we're going to talk about the implications of that rebellion again, and then how Jesus reversed the effects of that rebellion. And this one is really going to bake your brain. But to review, let's read the story of Babel again, found in, again, in Genesis 11, verses uh, 1 to, I think, 9 or so. So let's read that. Now the whole world had one language and a common speech. And as people moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar and settled there. And they said, come, let's build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens so that we may make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we will be scattered over the face of the earth. Then God responds and he says, come, let us go down 
and confused their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. And that's why it's called Babel, which is where we get the name Babylon. This is the beginning of that problem in human history. Because there the Lord confused the language of the whole world. And from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth. Why did he do that? Because remember the commission, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And what are they doing? They're gathering instead of scattering. They're they're not fulfilling the agenda that he had for them. So let's just review again, the implications of this. Then I'm gonna dive into what Jesus did and how this fits into the bigger picture. You're gonna love this. So first of all, we see that humans rebel against God by organizing in defiance of him and his Edenic mandate, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And then we see God divides the nations by confusing their language, causing them to scatter across the earth and at least in some fashion start to fill the earth and work at subduing it. Now, I should point out again, like I did last week, that a lot of what I'm sharing with you today and this last week uh, has been shaped profoundly by a New Testament, well, actually an Old Testament scholar named Michael Heiser. You can look him up online. He's a brilliant thinker and is really, his, his mission is to, to help us have the ancient Hebrew in our heads when we're reading the Old Testament so that we can see what they saw and interpret the way they would have interpreted what we're reading. And before I get into what I'm going to say today, I just want to pause. Uh, I said that in each of these three rebellions, there is a supernatural component and a human component. So in the first one, we've got the serpent and we have Adam and Eve. In the second one, we have the sons of God marrying the daughters of men. And then we have the proliferation of human evil. That's the flood. And then in Babel, so far, I haven't had time to unpack the supernatural. All we've talked about so far is the human aspect, which was the gathering instead of scattering and and making your name for ourselves and all this kind of stuff. So what I want to talk to you about today is, before I get into what Jesus reversed, is the supernatural part of this rebellion. And I should say this, as as we're doing this, so so this is stuff that most of us probably have not heard before. I'm going to show you. It's right in the text. It's right in in the scriptures. And the reason is that all three of these rebellions unfold in very characteristic narrative form in the Old Testament. In other words, as the story's happening, we get a little bit of commentary, but the full implications of that rebellion take the rest of the Bible to unpack. It may surprise you that Eden is actually not mentioned very much in the rest of the Old Testament. The fall in Eden and the serpents and all that is virtually unmentioned until we get to the New Testament and they look back on that event as being central. That's, that's another mind uh, bender. But what, what you see is the, the effects of Eden are impacted through the rest of scripture, sprinkled throughout, right? You see this at, at uh, the flood as well. And this, this unholy union and all that stuff takes a, the entire scripture to unpack. This story of Babel is no different. And so what I'm going to do today is show you some of those sprinklings that reflect back on this Babel event and give us some nuance, give us some some extra understanding about what's happening. All right. So one of these happens in Deuteronomy chapter 32. This is farther along in the Israel's in Israel's story. They've they've already b- become a nation. Uh, when when some of these things were written, Babel at the Tower of Babel, there was no Israel yet. Um, now they're a nation. They've been through Egypt. They've they've swelled in number. They've been released from Egypt. They're in the desert. They've got the law, the Ten Commandments, all that stuff. So now. This is an oral culture, primarily at this point. There there may have been some scrolls at some point, but we don't know exactly when it was written down, but they're looking back at their history. And this is what we read. It's a fascinating picture. Deuteronomy 32, verse seven says, remember the days of old. Remember the year or consider the years of many generations. So there's something we're supposed to remember. There's something we're supposed to consider. Ask your father and he will show you your elders and they will tell you. It could be that the, the, the father can show you in the scrolls because he could read and the elders were still oral and they couldn't read. And that's why the, the difference there. But it's interesting. So what he's about to say is it's kind of like if you're doubting what I'm saying, go check the sources. Okay. So, and this is what he says next. Watch this. 
When the Most High gave to the nations their inheritance, when he divided mankind, pause, when did he divide mankind? Genesis 11, this is talking about the Babel story now. So that's the context for what he's saying. He says, remember when that happened, when God divided the nations and everything, divided mankind? Yeah, okay, watch this. When he did that, when he divided mankind, he fixed the borders of the peoples, look at this, according to the number of the sons of God. We've seen these before. From Genesis chapter 6, these were these members of God's council, these supernatural beings that are not angels, but they're something else, and, and they're part of his divine council. They abandoned their posts, Jude and Peter say in their epistles, uh, to, to marry women and, and all of this. These are the same ones. These aren't the same the exact same ones. Those ones are, are kept in gloomy, dudge, uh, gloomy judgment and chains somewhere. But there's a new set of these beings or uh, that are left on his council. And it says that God fixed the borders or the boundaries of the peoples according to the number of the sons of God. Now, what we do know is in Genesis 10, right before this, the writer, uh, probably Moses, by what we can tell, has made a record, which is called the Table of Nations, a list of all the nations that exist at that time. And there are 72 of these nations. And so the very next chapter, he's talking about in, in, in chapter 11, the, the Tower of Babel and how God separates them into these nations. So there's 72 of them. So some, the Jews had this uh, kind of this tradition that there were 72 of these sons of God, these beings that were assigned one to each nation and off they went and formed the various cultures of the world. But look at this. But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, his allotted heritage. Now, at Babel, God's people didn't exist yet. So at the Tower of Babel, there are 70 nations assembled. And he, he scatters them across the earth. So he disowns all the nations of the world, all 72 of them at that point. And he assigns these sons of God to, to manage their affairs and to govern them. We'll see exactly what his purpose was after this. But he's got no portion at this point. Why? Because he's disowned everybody. So chapter 12 in Genesis, what happens? He approaches a guy named Abraham and starts over with the, the father of who will become Israel, his people. Okay, so God's portion is Israel. Everybody else kind of gets this angelic figure, this quasi-divine lower D being assigned to them. This is what's going on. So now let's add to our, our summary. So not only did God divide the nations, he also disinherits the nations, assigning the sons of God to oversee them. And then in chapter 12, he births Israel as his portion. He starts over. It's like a new Eden, sort of. Interestingly enough, this, this theme is picked up in the New Testament by the Apostle Paul as he's addressing all the false gods in Athens where he is visiting on one of his missionary journeys. And he's walking around seeing all of these altars to all these different gods and he sees an altar to an unknown god. And he says, hey, I'd love to tell you about that one you don't know about. He's actually the God of heaven and earth, the, the most high God, the God above all gods. And this is what I want to show you about him. And this is what he says. He says, from one man, he, that unknown God, which we now know is the God of Israel, to Yahweh, he made all the nations that they should inhabit the whole earth. There's that commission. Their job is to inherit the earth, not to gather, right? And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. He's making a direct connection to the Tower of Babel. Now, you might be thinking, well, how are other cultures supposed to know about this? Because this is about Israel. No, actually, remember that this, this story of Babel actually appears in many different cultures. And so they, they would have said, oh, that, that event, that, that one? Yeah, that one. Well, God is, God is the author of that, the God I'm talking about is the author of that. Now look at this. He says, God did this. What? Scattered the nations, gave them their divisions, assigned them these sons of God, all this, so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he's not far from any of us or one of us. So what, what God's intention was, 
by assigning these lesser Elohim to the sons of God, to these nations, was that they were supposed to lead and guide this people that they were assigned, that they were responsible for, in such a way that they would eventually find their way back. See, they had said, we don't want anything to do with God. God says, fine, then, then go your own way. But he's, his heart for them is that they would come back. And, and obviously this didn't happen, did it? So this was God's intention. But the very fact that in this pantheon, as, as Paul is looking around in Athens, he sees the unknown God, but they don't know who it is, shows that these beings drop the ball, right? And so what, what we know throughout different places in Scripture, especially some of the prophets and the Psalms, is we, we kind of piece together the fact that these sons of God also rebelled. The ones that were assigned to the nations also rebelled, kind of said, you know what? Feels kind of nice to be worshipped. People misinterpreted, right? They're, they're, they're angelic, and, and so they start to get worshipped. They're like, you know, I am pretty, uh, pretty awesome, and I'm in charge, and God's given me this responsibility, so I think I'm just going to accept the worship. And they started to corrupt the nations and created religions around worship of these false gods that were supposed to be helping people. They were stewards of this nation, and they were dropping the ball. So in Psalm 82, we have this unbelievably bizarre depiction of a scene in the heavenly places. I want to show you this and you're going to go, what? And some translations actually translate it a little differently because they don't quite know what to do with it. But a literal translation actually reads what, like what the ESV is showing us. So let me just, which is uh, English standard version. So Psalm 82 verse one, <laughs> God has taken his place in the divine council. This is what I've been talking about. This divine council made up of these sons of God. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Something's going down. He's judging these characters called gods, little g. And they have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. So these are these Elohim, little, little g, Right, or the little d divine beings, right? These, these sons of God who's portioned things out. They have dropped the ball. They are leading people in darkness. And as a result, the, the foundations of the earth are shaken. This is not how the cosmos are, are supposed to operate. So the rest of the psalm then goes into this eschatological um, promise that God will eventually judge these beings and restore the nations to their proper place. So he actually says, Listen, but this is God speaking. He said, I said, you are gods, sons of the most high, all of you. Nevertheless, like men, you shall die and fall like any prince. Right? This is so bizarre. So basically he's saying you have assumed the role of gods, false gods in these other religions. And because you've abandoned your post, judgment is coming. And by the way, you will not live forever like I originally intended. You will die like any human being does. Judgment is coming. We know that this is part of what Jesus accomplished, right? On the cross, there was death and resurrection. He will accomplish at the end if you read the book of Revelation. But basically now we're gonna update our, our list again. So now we've got God divides the nations, God disinherits the nations, birthing Israel has his portion, and then these other sons of God also rebel by accepting worship, becoming the false gods and religions of the nations. Now, <laughs> again, remember what Genesis 1 to 11 is, is trying to accomplish. It's trying to show us the way the world works and why it is the way it is. It's trying to show us who the one true God is above all other gods. So now we know through these three rebellions where the sin and brokenness and death came from. We know where these unholy partnerships came from. And we know where the false religions of the world came from. This is showing the people of Israel, this is where all those religions came from. If you're ever wondering, how can there be all these other religions that believe all these different things. How do we know that ours is the one true religion? This is written to establish that fact. This is where it comes from. This is why Israel is the one true expression of what God is intending on earth. Why? Because it's his portion. He's disinherited these others. They're all running after their own thing with vestiges of the original story running through all of their narratives, but nevertheless, they're walking in darkness, the foundations of the earth 
are shaken. Now you see this pop up in various places, this idea that there are these fallen figures assigned to different kingdoms. You see Daniel chapter 10, when the prophet Daniel's fasting and praying for an answer from God, and suddenly <laughs> angel Gabriel breaks in, he's kind of breathless. You can read the story yourself. And he says, oh, we heard your prayer three weeks ago, but I've been battling the prince of Persia. And Michael, the archangel, had to come and help me break through, and I'm here now. But just so you know, the prince of Greece is also coming. Now, do you think that the angel Gabriel is wrestling against a physical earthly ruler? No. These are divine, semi-divine, right? Lower D beings, these, these fallen ones that have mismanaged their care, their, their wards, these nations of the world that they're supposed to be leading back to God and are actually leading not just away from God, but to oppress God's portion, Israel. These are the uh, principalities and powers that you see Paul talk about over and over again in the New Testament, like Ephesians 6.12. Uh, Jude actually calls them celestial beings in Jude verse 8. And you see kind of behind the scenes, like a, a, a curtain being pulled back in Ezekiel 28, where God is judging the nation of Tyre, T-Y-R-E. And his judgment is broken into two parts. One part is judging the earthly king. He says, you think you're a god, you're not a god, you're just a man. And then it switches gears halfway through and he starts addressing this supernatural being who was in Eden, who, was on, who walked among the fiery stones and, and who, who has is, who is like got all these supernatural attributes and says, you will die like a man, but you're, you're not a man, right? And so you can see this, and especially this, this happened in antiquity in particular, the pharaohs, the kings saw themselves as intermediaries of the gods, sort of a, an incarnation of the gods. And so there's this unholy partnership between an earthly king and the spirit prince or spirit king. So we can see this very clearly throughout the Old Testament and God's judgment against the nations. Now, like I mentioned, when God disinherited the nations and assigned out, parceled them out according to the number of the sons of God, he didn't have a portion yet. What he had was an idea and a plan. And so he, he calls to a man named Abraham and Abraham becomes the father of what will become Israel. And his promise to Abraham in chapter 12 of Genesis and then chapter 15 is what? That through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. So even though God has disinherited the nations, he's got a plan somehow in the works to redeem them. Um, to bring them under his rule again, to bring them under his blessing and his kingdom. Now, when Jesus arrives on the scene, again, <laughs> to reverse these rebellions and the implications of these rebellions, how does he play into this whole reversal of Babel? Well, when he picks his apostles, his, his disciples, his initial crew, how many of them are there? There are 12 disciples. Why 12? What are they symbolic of? The 12 tribes of Israel. What are, what are the 12 tribes of Israel? The Lord's portion. So he starts with his portion, these 12 tribes, his portion. And then what he does is he disciples them, trains them. They recruit more. And there are, there's a beautiful story in Luke chapter 10. And I want to point this out to you. You can just go, what? So awesome. So after this, the Lord appointed 72 others. Notice this is not just 72, including the 12. This is the 12 plus the 72. Why, why is it 72 others? Because the 12 are his portion. What about the 72? Do you remember how many nations were in the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10? 72. So what do these 72 others represent? The nations. When God sends them out, what is he doing? He's sending them out to, to prepare, look, and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. He sends them as heralds into the countryside to announce that Jesus has arrived and he has begun the reclamation of the nations. That's what this was happening. So this is a massive spiritual warfare event 
Which is why near the end of the story, Luke 10, 8 and 9, we read that um, whenever you enter a town and they receive you, eat what is set before you and then heal the sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near to you. The Eden project is back on track, right? The kingdom of God has come upon you. What's the result of this proclamation? We see it at the end in verse 17 and 18. The 72 returned with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And Jesus is like nodding. He's like, yep. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven or from the heavens. There, you, you displaced something. You, you, you accomplished something cosmic by going out and proclaiming. The kingdom of God is here. And he's beginning his reclamation of the nations. Uh, th this is not just one place, by the way. This theme occurs over and over again in Jesus' ministry and the New Testament. So do you remember what the Great Commission is? The Great Commission is Jesus' commission to, to his disciples. And it is a direct uh, extension of the Edenic mandate. So be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it right? Now the nations have been lost. They've been parceled out and disinherited. We've given our way authority. Now Jesus takes the authority back and begins the process of reclaiming the nations. So now what is his commission to his disciples look like? He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe or obey all that I have commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So he sends them out to reclaim the nations. How? By making disciples. This is how he's reclaiming the nations. Let me just unpack that. So what we see is that in Eden, Adam and Eve and By extension, every human being receives this commission. Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. We lose the authority to subdue it by listening to the devil, but we're still running with this Eden mandate. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, right? So now, though, in Jesus' kingdom, the reboot of this Eden agenda, we aren't just automatically folded into this mandate. Now we have to opt in. The kingdom project is now expanded through people who opt in through faith in Jesus. That's what this Great Commission shows. The second thing we can see in the Great Commission is that we are actually subduing the earth by re and reclaiming the nations by making more disciples of Jesus. It's subdued willingly by helping people obey what Jesus commanded, bowing the knee to Jesus, coming under his authority. As we do that, we receive the authority he took back from the devil. And we, we start to reclaim the nations. <laughs> Can you see that the Great Commission and, and the mission we're part of as a church is so much bigger than you ever dreamed? Now, I haven't even got to the, the really exciting stuff yet, because I want to talk about the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was the visible reversal of Babel. It was like the anti-Babel, and you can see it in the language that is used. It's very deliberately chosen to mirror what happened at Babel and then reverse the effects of it and, and then use it actually for God's glory. So in Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus promises his disciples, this is before he ascends to heaven, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea. What's that? That's the surrounding countryside. This is Israel's territory. And Samaria next. What was Samaria? Samaria is where the lost tribes of Israel lived. In other words, the ones who kind of wandered off and been mushed together with the other nations. That's where they lived in Samaria. And they're kind of seen as like the black sheep of the family and they didn't get along, but it's going to happen there. Why? Because Jesus is reclaiming, he's beginning with his portion, the 12 tribes of Israel. And then it says to the end of the earth. This is how it's going to happen. So the Holy Spirit's going to come and it's going to empower this, this move all across the earth. So Here it goes. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Does that sound familiar? 
what happened on the plain of Shinar in Genesis chapter 11. They all gathered together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated, that were divided in, in the Septuagint. It's the same word used in Genesis chapter 11. And divided, separated, and came to rest on each of them. Have you ever wondered why tongues? Like, why the tongue? What's, what's that? It, because God is closing the story loop with Babel. That's what he's doing. And all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. What happened at Babel? The, the Spirit came and separated them and gave them each different tongues. This is exactly what's happening here, except there's a massive difference. Look what happens next. Now, there were staying in Jerusalem at that time, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. He's making a specific point, and he lists actually what these nations are. And if you look at what they represent in that day, in that modern day, it covers the area covered by the, the table of 72 nations. But just in case you missed it, he says, all nations under heaven. He's saying, so that thing that happened at Babel, this is being reversed because all nations are part of this. When they heard the sound of this rushing wind and these other tongues, these other languages being spoken, a crowd came together in bewilderment. That word bewilderment is confused. It's the same word again in the Septuagint Greek as we go back and read Genesis 11. Same word. They're confused their language. They're confused now. Except, here's the flip. Here's the twist. Here's the, the cliffhanger. Because each one heard their own language being spoken. So instead of everyone hearing these different languages and being divided, now through the Spirit of God, we are given the ability to understand each other. And this, the gift of tongues and, and the gift of what God is doing in, this, in the Spirit right now is reunifying all the people that are gathered from every nation under heaven. What happens? They then all, or not all, but 3,000 of them bow the knee to Jesus, give their lives to Christ. He's, so in other words, they experience personally the undoing of Eden and the undoing of the flood in themselves through the work of Jesus on the cross, his death and resurrection, his ascension. Now he pours out his Holy Spirit and, and Babel itself is reversed. And what do those people do? after Passover, after the, or sorry, Pentecost is over, this festival that they're gathered in Jerusalem for, they go back to the nations to form little cell groups. What are they doing? They're going, just like Jesus sent his 72 ahead, now they're going back into all those 72 nations, and what are they doing? They're going to visit, or going back to the places where the apostles will eventually visit and go and establish real kingdom outposts. This is so exciting. I just love this. Now, I think we've covered enough. Can I just, can I just make a few points as we, as we close? Um, we've seen that the mission of God began in Eden. And it was derailed by our rebellions. It has been rebooted by Jesus and is now entrusted to us. To complete. God's mission has woven its way through all of human history and it lands at your doorstep. It, it, it runs into you. It runs right through your own heart, my heart, and you and I are called to opt in, to respond. Now our, our temptation is going to be say, I just want Jesus to forgive my sins, give me a place to go where I die. I kind of want him to help me with my life, but I want to live my own life. But the, 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 the problem is that this mission is well underway and it's the purpose of our existence. In fact, even as a church, I would say the church exists to carry out the mission of God. I know this because the mission of God existed before there was a church. The, the mission of God to create heaven on earth existed before Adam and Eve were even a thing. 
And so they were placed into the garden. They were placed into a mission in progress. The purpose of their existence, the purpose of Israel's existence, the purpose of the church's existence is to carry out the mission of God. Now, Along the way, do we need to care for each other and care for the earth? Do we need to, to, you know, spend time loving others? Of course, that's all part of the Eden mandate to make the earth like heaven, heaven on earth. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Last piece, and I'm going to close with this. You may not like this. God gathers the scattered and he scatters the gathered. Do you notice this, that the the, the rebellion at Babel and the human part was gathering instead of scattering and filling the earth and subduing it. So what happens at Pentecost is he gathers the people together so he can scatter them again, so that they can go spread and, and this kingdom mandate wherever they go. A little, a couple of chapters later in the book of Acts, uh, the, the apostles that were still living in Jerusalem still hadn't really gone anywhere. And the, the believers were still staying in Jerusalem. A lot of them didn't go home like God intended. And so God allows a persecution to break out. And what happens? The church is scattered and they start kicking off the kingdom into high gear. And that's when Christianity really took off in the Roman world. God gathers the scattered and he scatters the gathered. This is still true today. One of the understandable but cautionary elements of this pandemic is that we have been so focused on our big gatherings that we've forgotten that there is great power in being scattered. This helps us actually in this season recapture some of our Eden mandate, this kingdom mandate that we are supposed to go and make disciples of all the nations. This this is part of what God is doing. I'm not saying he caused it, but this is certainly part of what God is doing. And we all experience this. Every church experiences this. The more we, look look at this, the more we gather and the, the bigger we can make our church. Why? To make a name for ourselves. The, the, the more we do that, the, the more we lose the plot of the mission. And the more we lose the plot of the mission, the more confused we get. We start, st- the work stops, just like it did on the tower. And, and then we start to fight with each other. And we start speaking different languages because we're focused on different things. And we begin to scatter anyways. So the real question is, will we be those who gather in order to scatter, to go and sh- spread the kingdom? Or will we gather so tightly that God has to scatter us? Just something I want to leave you with. As we close, will you say something with me? Will you repeat these words with me? As you see the grand story that you're part of, will you say with me, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to your lordship and mission. I don't know what that means in this season of COVID. I don't know what that means in a post-pandemic world. But I, Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to your lordship and mission. Say that with me. Lord Jesus, I surrender my life to your lordship and mission. Amen. Hey, we're so glad you joined us today and we'd love to connect with you. If you haven't reached out already, please text that number on the screen with the word connect me and we'd love to talk with you about how you could become part of the Manifest family, both online or in person or a mix of the two in this crazy world that we now live in. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you that we got to spend this time together today. Thank you that your mission, Jesus, is far greater, far grander than we could ever comprehend. And we're sorry for the ways that we've tried to make it about us when really we're part of a story that is worth giving our lives to because you did. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great day.